I had to borrow my wife's pink Bible because uh, <laughs> the only one I have is King James, and usually I read it on my phone these days. But hey, man, it's a blessing to be up here. Thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity. Um, a little nervous, probably not quite as nervous as I should be, because I always think I'm going to do better than what I actually do. Like I've always thought I'm better looking than what I actually am, and more athletic than what I actually am, and I feel pretty tall most of the time, depending on who I hang around. But uh, it's a blessing, it's an honor. Um, it's been a long time. It's like maybe 13, 14 years or something like that um, since I've had the honor. Um, it's been a um, it's been a long circle back. And uh, forgive me, man. I just I'm so thankful. And uh, that God's enduring kindness and his love, his mercy. And, and a lot of it, I'm just not used to the anointing that comes with preaching. I'm just not. And because uh, it, it's, it's got a, it can be overwhelming at times. Um, so I think part of that's just me getting used to it. So if you see me tear up, yes, I am a sissy. And um, oh, yeah, this will, make me look, this will make me a little more manly. Excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Anyways, but. <laughs> So I was praying, believe it or not, I do that from time to time, and I asked God what he wanted me to share with you, because uh, you know, we can always, we can all, we've all got testimonies, we've all got things that God's done for us and we can share, um, but I wanted, man, I wanted it to be a special word for y'all for this time and for this season, and, uh, and I feel like the Lord's given me that. Uh, so without further ado, um, we're going to be talking this morning on Gideon. Some of us know the story, some of us may not know the story, um, but I, I guess... The one thing that the Lord has, has taught me, um, you know, I guess, uh, well, let me back up and say this. Since the last time I preached, my life has significantly changed. I'm married to a beautiful woman in the back who um, hopefully she doesn't listen to this message because I'll probably say some things about her that, you know, make me look good. No. Uh, to my wonderful wife, Carol, I've got a beautiful daughter, Adeline, who's back there. Um, I'm so blessed. And... Um, so much more, last time I preached I was in my 20s, now I'm in my 40s. And so if I don't kind of go along to say something. Um, but, uh, so I guess I look at things a little different sometimes, you know, you know when you're a, a husband and a father and a protector and a provider, you know, and those types of things, you take on new roles. And your life just becomes more full. It's not that you're different, you know, or that you've uh, significantly changed and, you know, altered who you are on the inside. I'm always that, I'll always be 16 in my head. Like, I do not, I should not have gotten married, you know, I should not have kids for sure. Like, I have a house, I pay insurances and mortgages, and like, I have to do normal people stuff. I show up to work early, like real early, every morning, you know, and it's like, dude, I'm stuck on stupid three quarters of the time, and I love being that way. I love being silly, I love being goofy. I love being silly, goofy with whoever I'm around. I like being silly and goofy with the Lord sometimes. Um, uh, but, uh, so I guess, you know, you, you look at things differently. And one of the things that the Lord has taught me, um, just as, about as far as being a man of God, and you can be a woman of God, you know, we'll say a human of God. Does that make sense? If we're in Canada, a they, them of God, you know, if we're going to be politically correct, right? They, them, he, she, huh, huh, this way. Yeah, it, you know. Uh, uh, I'm glad y'all thought that was funny. I thought it was funny. Uh, that's another one I think that I always think that I'm the funniest guy in the room at all times. Like if y'all people, if other people thought I was as funny as I think I am, I'd be Kevin Hart. I'd be rich. I wouldn't be here. I'd be, I'd be in Hollywood. No offense. <laughs> but we're going to start out. Let's get this a word now that I've rambled on for that. Let's go open up to uh, the book of Judges. Somewhere this Bible has a Judges in it somewhere. And, and I, want, I don't want to read the whole thing because it's a lot of verbiage, um, and we'd be here. Good thing is that the saints are on a bye this week, so, you know, because if they wouldn't have been, 11.15, we was going to be out of here, you know. <laughs> Might be my last time preaching. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things God's taught me over the years is to face your fears and those things that you don't like um, uh, in your marriage, in your relationships, in your workplace, uh, inside your own mind and your heart. Um, your own uh, pet sins, your own flesh that you could that we all contend with, right? To uh, not run from it, not that you focus on it to where it becomes this overwhelming, almighty thing, and, and it blocks out uh, your faith from you know being able to pierce through that thing. 
but acknowledge it and be honest and be humble with yourself and, and realize. And it, it also, um, it, puts you, it puts that pecking order in right, man. When you see things that's in your life, you know, we all, we're raising kids. You know, God bless me when she's a teenager because, dude she's, dude, she's a savage. She's a warrior, Cherokee, Indian, my daughter. Bro. She don't stop, and she's got a backbone. That she's fierce at all times and deadly. And so I'm not ready for teenage years, and I've heard some stories, and I've seen a lot of my friends, you know. And uh, so those are things that you can't control, you know. What are you going to do? What am I going to do when she goes and does whatever? She goes and does whatever she wants now. She's five, you know. <laughs> Nothing works, you know. You look at her, and she looks at you meaner. So, like, ooh, I'm going to have to come up with a new tactic. But God has taught me, man, to, to look at those things and don't, don't shy off from them. And sometimes they're ugly, you know. Sometimes they're um, hurtful. Sometimes they make you sad. Sometimes they make you want to cry. Sometimes it can be so overwhelming. The thought of it, you just, if, if, if it comes across your mind, you just want to, you just want to change the channel in your brain, you know, and run away from that thing. But what you don't realize is that a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times, um, God's bringing that, he's putting you on that channel because he wants you to deal with it. Because he wants you to be a witness for him. Because he wants, he created you to be this. And right now you're working your way there, but that's a, that's a roadblock. And he wants you to deal with that thing so that he can pour more of his fulfillment, more of his love, more of his peace, and you know, so on and so forth into you. And that thing is a roadblock. And so, and if you're hard-headed like me and like a lot of people, um, like, well, Lord, let's deal with something else. You know, look, there's a lot of stuff in my life to deal with. Let's pick one of the other things. We'll put that one on the back shelf, you know. And, uh, and so you end up going around the mountain. Well, Gideon had a problem. Gideon's problem was fear. He was scared for good reason, you know. And so we're going to start out reading. It said, in the Israelites, this is Gideon, chapter, uh, Judges, chapter 6, verse 1. It said, the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So for seven years, remember that number, for seven years he handed them over to the people of Midian. The Midianites treated the Israelites very badly. That's why they made hiding places for themselves. They hid holes in the mountains. They also hid in the caves and in other safe places. Each year, the people planted their crops. When they did, the Midianites came into the country and attacked it. So the Amalekites and the other tribes from the east, they camped in the land. They destroyed the crops all the way to Gaza. I mean, you know, we still have wars and stuff like that around Gaza today, huh? So they destroyed all the, the crops all the way to Gaza. They didn't spare any living thing for Israel. They didn't spare any sheep or cattle or donkeys. And the Midianites came up with their livestock and tents, and they camped like huge numbers of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They came into the land to destroy it. And the Midianites made the land very poor. So what did they do? They, so the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. I mean, how many times have we done that? Cried out to the Lord for help. Thank God that he hears our cries. He does. Even when it's our own fault, he hears our cries. It's like, man, dude, God, if it was me, I'd have kicked my beat at the curb a long time ago. You know, we, we're going to get rid of you, and we're going to go adopt a new child or something, you know? And so I just get, it goes into the, the loving, uh, the tender mercies. And I think, the, you know, we're down here playing checkers, and God's up in heaven playing chess. You know, it's just like he's on a whole new, like he sees the end. He created the end. You know, he, you know, the Bible says uh, that Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world. He knew the end from the beginning. You know, people want to get caught up in the predestination, and I don't believe in that. I believe that there's a foreknowledge that, that, that accompanies the wisdom that God has and that he lives with and that he deals with us in. And a lot of times we're just not ready to understand it. You know, um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around common core math, you know, <laughs> much less uh, the, the wisdom and uh, the plan that God has for us. So number one, God hears our cries. So number two, he speaks, uh, he speaks and prophesies over us while we are still in darkness. So we're going to skip down to verse 11 uh, through 16. It says, the angel of the Lord came, and he sat down under an oak tree in Ophrah. Uh, the tree belonged to Joash, and he was on the family line of Abiezer. Abiezer, one of those guys. <laughs> Gideon, Gideon was on the threshing floor. Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press at Ophrah. So if it makes any sense, so they had the wine press, and it's either a hole dug in the ground or um, they'll 
stack up stones around it and they would go mush down all the grapes and that's how they make wine, right? But anyway, there was a, there was a way to, to hide from it because they weren't doing that. He was trying to separate the wheat from the chaff. So he would go in there and hide so the Midianites wouldn't see him. And so that he'd have, because they were going in, like his Bible said it, they would destroy everything. So here he is, a grown man, probably wife and kids, I would assume, you know, supposed to be, dads are supposed to be strong and all-knowing and can fix everything, you know, well, at least other dads, not me, but, uh, you know, you're supposed to be the strength of your family, and here he is on his hands and knees, cowering like a worm, for good reason. It wasn't, it wasn't, he wasn't doing it because he was scared of the wind, he was doing it because he's scared of those uh, Midianites that were uh, like locusts, that you couldn't even count them. I would be doing the same thing. In fact, I might send my wife out. Like, hey, hey, wine breast over there, might want to crawl, you know, <laughs> you know. Don't holler if you get in trouble. <laughs> uh, let's see, what is that? So, so he was threshing in a wine press to hide the wheat from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon and he said, Mighty warrior, the Lord is with you. Pardon me, sir, Gideon replied. You say the Lord is with us? Then why are all these, uh, then, why, then why has all of this happened to us? Where are all the wonderful things he has done? Our people uh, of long ago told us about them. They said, didn't the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has deserted us. He has handed us over, uh, he has handed us over to Midian. The Lord turned to Gideon and he said to him, you are strong, go and save Israel from the power of Midian. I am sending you. What? So well, usually in a normal conversation, say if you tell me something and, and I don't understand it, ask you a question about it, Typically, you would try to explain my question or try to, you know, okay, what's this mean? Uh, okay, well, let me show you what this means. The angel of the Lord came there with God's message. He didn't come there to contend with Gideon. He wasn't going to sink down to that level. He came there with a word from heaven. And he said, you're a mighty man, a warrior. And then Gideon's like, ah. And then he says, uh, uh, above and beyond you being a mighty man, a warrior, you're going to deliver Israel. And so now, I mean, can you imagine that? How many times have... have um, we come across something and the Lord will speak to us, or you feel like the Lord may be speaking to you, and, but it doesn't really line up with what you've been asking God for. Lord, I'm praying for finance. Lord, I'm praying for finance. And, or I'm praying for this relationship over here. And you know God, you still feel his presence. He's, doing, he's working in your life, but he's not working on that. Well, God didn't come here in, the, let's say, this particular circumstance. He might have come here to deal with you on that. He might have come over here to deal you with deal uh, with you with this. Hey, man, you need to go forgive that person, or whatever the case is, you know? Um, see, the way he, that angel came with a message from the Lord. And so we need to pay attention, man. When God speaks to us, number one, know if God's speaking to you or not. Test that spirit and try it, you know? Worship the Lord with, with that word and see if it, see if it lines up. Because if it doesn't praise uh, the Lord and it doesn't exalt the name of Christ, it's not, a, it's not a, of the Lord. Um, so, so try those, those words and try those feelings and try those thoughts. And, and uh, Gideon did a lot of that. And uh, let's see. Pardon me, sir. Oh, yeah, it says, um, let's hand us over. Whatever was that? Pardon me, said. What are these wonderful things? Oh, yeah. He has, handed us, uh, he has handed us over to Midian. Verse 14, it says, The Lord turned to Gideon. He said to him, You are strong. Go and save Israel from the power of Midian. I am sending you. Pardon me, sir, Gideon replied, but how can I possibly save Israel? My family group is the weakest in the tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least important member of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, so you will strike down the Midianites, and you will leave no one alive. If you go read it in the King James, which is what I was kind of studying out of, it said you will strike the entire Midianite army, hundreds of thousands of men. You will strike them down as if they were one man. One man, right? So you got, how do you go hundreds of thousands to one? So, uh, so this angel of the Lord, so Gideon um, said, well, man, if you're the angel of the Lord, let me go back, and I won't read all this, but you'll go back and let me go prepare a feast, and we'll come back here, and, and we'll eat together. And, and, uh, and so he does that, and he puts this, the uh, food down on, that Gideon's prepared on these rocks, and the angel of the Lord touches it with his staff, and it's consumed with fire. So, so that's like his first, okay, that, that's some proof. So I'm starting to feel a little better about this whole, I'm the least of the least of the least. Uh, taking on this Midianite army, you know, it's like when the Lord always chooses the runts, you know, he does. That's why I'm up here, right? <laughs> uh, the Lord always chooses the runts. Um, 
because you know, in, in, in our weaknesses, he's made strong. It's just true. You go look at the book of Acts. They had fishermen out there speaking in tongues and prophesying, and, and thousands are getting saved. Fishermen, man. Um, you know, you got uh, uh, Peter, James, and John. They weren't uh, educated men. Now, some of them were, like Matthew was educated and things like that. But uh, these weren't exactly rocket scientists. And uh, I think most of us in this room here probably fall in that. So we're going to see in, uh, point number three. Gideon's response to God. So after all of that happens, and the angel of the Lord, you know, consumes that, that, that dinner that Gideon prepared, Gideon starts thinking, well, you know what, maybe, maybe there might be something to this. So in verse 24, so Gideon built an altar there to the Lord to honor the Lord. He called it to the Lord, he called it the Lord is peace, and it still stands in Ophrah to this day, and Ophrah is in the territory, belongs to the family of Ebiezer. So the first thing he did is when God called him out of, uh, out of that sin, um, God called him from normality. God called him from depression. God called him from a, a, a point of weakness. Nobody likes to be taken advantage of. Like, that's one thing that maybe it's pride, maybe it's ego. I don't like it when you know, if you lose at something or something doesn't work out, okay, you know, whatever. You know, dust yourself up, pick, up, pick, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, move on, try again, try something else, you know. Get smarter, get better, work harder. Um, give more of yourself to whatever, like you can figure it out, right? Um, that's different than losing, but sometimes you're being just taken advantage of. How many times we see people, and family members, or just people we know, and it's like, this world is, it's like raping their souls, man. It's just, it's eating them alive, it's not fair. And they're just, it'd be like, uh, uh, with the whole uh, child uh, sex trafficking thing, like that's that, that's the most evil, and they're kids, you know? I mean, so many times you maybe, and I know that's a real extreme uh, uh, portrayal of, of, of what I'm talking about, but you see people and it's like, man, they're just totally being taken advantage of. They have no defenses, you know? And that's what Midian, I mean, that's what Gideon was. He had, who is he? He's the least of the least of the least. Even if he tried to try to raise an insurrection, nobody's gonna listen to what this guy's got to say. You know, we just had the, uh, the election for uh, Samuel Parish president. If I'd have got up there with a microphone, nobody cares what Dan has to say. <laughs> nope, nobody uh, up there, nobody in the house half the time. Half the time, I don't care what I had to say because I say a lot of, you know, I can't say stupid because that's on Braden's no-go list. There's a lot of foolish things to say, you know. Uh, Mr. Daniel, you shouldn't have said stupid. Uh, and so, uh, so who is, who is Midian? So we're going to script over to verse 25. So, so the first thing Gideon did is he built an altar to the Lord. And you've got to realize that the reason why they were, uh, I maybe should have started with this. Uh, the reason why that they, uh, maybe should have started with this. The reason why that uh, the Midianites came in the first place is because they started worshiping false gods. And uh, if you still think, think about it, like, well, you know, worshiping false, at least still worshiping the regular God too, or regular God, the one true God, should I say. Uh, you know, what's up, you know, okay, they, they've got a few other temples up. Does that really constitute God coming in and wiping them out? Like, you know, all but wiping them out, should I say. Those are remnant left, of course. But, and just destroying everything. They came in there like locusts and just the cattle, the sheep, you know, probably carrying their family members away for slaves and all. You know, that's what they did back then. That's what happened. And, um, and they, they started carving out these ash terra poles, and that involved this whole... Uh, just sexual immorality. So it wasn't like, okay, you know, you've got uh, Assembly of God Church here and you've got Jehovah's Witness or Catholic or Muslim or whatever. It, it wasn't like it was just a, oh, it's just another church. Man, it was some wicked, evil, evil, demented stuff that was sent there and, and uh, put in the, uh, that the Israelites allowed in it as a cancer. And that cancer, if it's not dealt with, it's going to take over. It's going to kill, it's going to kill the body. And so God, that's, that's the way God looked at it. And so, um, so the first thing Gideon did is he built an altar to the Lord out in the open, which is a big deal. This guy was thrashing wheat in the wine press on his hands and knees and on his belly, and now he's building an altar out in the open to the Lord. So there's a change there immediately. And it's just little baby steps. You know, Gideon just, just you're going to see Gideon takes baby steps. And uh, how many of y'all are thankful for baby steps, man? I'm so, so thankful. Like, God, it's like, Lord, you know me. 
I'm a baby step kind of guy. I'm not a big step kind of guy. If, I, if, if I'm going to take a big step, you're going to just have to knock me unconscious and move me where you want me to put me and just do something with me. Um, if not, thank you for those baby steps. So in verse 25, this was Gideon. So that was Gideon's first response was building an altar. He restored worship. You know, how many times you're going through something hard in your life? You got to restore worship, man. You back up, man. That, when the enemy punches you in the face and it hurts and you're confused. I mean, you know, you've been in a fight, you've been punched in the nose immediately. If it's a good punch, your eyes are going to start watering. You can't see. And that's going to confuse you. And it's because you don't know when's the next punch coming. Or where is it coming from? And so you start backing up and you just want to do this. You just want to turtle up. And it's the same way, you know, it could be emotionally. When the enemy comes and, and you get a bill in the mail, or you get uh, a negative medical report, or um, you get bad news about a family member, or whatever the case is, right? That thing hits you, man, and it's just this cloudiness and confusion, and it can be overwhelming. So it's like right then and there, man, we need to do like Gideon did. And the first thing we need to do, first, always and for is worship. Go get to that place and get along with God and leave that where it's at the best you can. Sometimes you can't just separate yourself from it, you know. Um, but you go to God with a, with a true heart and a humble heart, a heart full of anxiety, you know, a heart full of fear, a heart full of uh, hurt or hate, whatever it is. And you go through it and you worship God. You let him start it out on the right. You build an altar right there. You say, Lord, you've, I know you've done stuff for me. I'm building an altar. And we're going to start this thing out right. And if I, if I fall in, our, in, in dealing with this situation and I don't handle it right, that's okay. I'm going to back up all the way to this altar and we're going to start over again. And we're going to deal with it the right way. Uh, it's just the truth. I mean, this is how you do it. At least this is how I do it. I don't know nothing else. Uh, a friend of mine was... Um, about two months ago, he could call me up. He's been my old roommate, and uh, he went out of town for uh, a wedding. I came back in, and his wife's gone, kids gone, bank accounts empty, and you know, and it hasn't gotten any better since then. And he backslidden from the Lord, and, and I told him, I said, "Look, Corey, I said I'm not gonna preach to you, man. You know the truth." I was like, "What you need is you need a friend. He needs somebody." And I said, "Now we'll tell you the truth. I won't sugarcoat anything. If the Lord puts something on my heart, tell you, I'll tell you. You know." I was like. First off, I love you, and I'm sorry. Like, I'm, I'm heartbroken that you're going through this. And that's where I started it from, because that's, that's what he needed at the, at the time. And um, he didn't need somebody to go there and go beat him over the head. He was just confused and hurt and angry, like I would be too. You know, man, someone takes your kid, you know, that's, you know, that's pretty heavy. Verse 25, for the 15th time. So this is his second response. That same night, the Lord spoke to Gideon. He said, get the second bull from your father's herd. Get the one that was seven years old. Tear down the altar um, your father built to honor the god named Baal and cut down the pole beside it, which was the Ashtarah pole. The pole is used to worship the female god named Asherah. Let's see. Verse 26. Then build the right kind of altar. Build it to honor the Lord your God. Build it on top of this hill. Then use the wood from that share pole you cut down and sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering. So Gideon went and got 10 of his servants and did just as the Lord had told him. But he was afraid of his family. He was also afraid of the people living in the town. So everything he did, he did it at night instead of during the day. So, so I mean, so he's, at least he's moving forward. He's out of the wine press. He's built one altar. Now he's going to go tear down everybody. He's going to go tear down the Superdome Saturday before the Saints play the Super Bowl, right? Like, he's, this is what he's going to do. And uh, if, if, if we were going to, you know, uh, do a comparison there. And I'm pretty sure that they have some people in New Orleans that got pretty upset that if that would ever happen, right? Like, wait a minute. What are we supposed to do on Sundays? You want us to go to church? No, we're supposed to be tailgating, getting tanked up, ready, ready for the, ready for the uh, for the black and gold. I mean, he might have some issues, um, but he did it. He still was contending with this fear, a legit fear. It wasn't some made up uh, fear. It was legit. I'll be scared too. Um, how many of us, you know, when you turn and you do things for the Lord, sometimes we've had to deal with the um, backlash from family members, from friends, uh, from bosses. Uh, 
from spouses, you know, from children, you know, those people that, that, are, that are closest to you. So um, uh, I think it puts things into perspective, man, that when you really uh, take on some of the, uh, you sit there and you think about what this, what this decision to follow Christ um, is, it, it can have some real heavy repercussions initially, you know, and it could be a, uh, seem like it's gonna be a, a big price at first. Um, but just like when um, Abraham told Isaac, you know, I want you to kill your son, who he waited 100 years for. And he said he didn't hold, he didn't hold it back, he was gonna do it. And, uh, and then, you know, we all know the story, Abraham was caught in a thicket, and he ended up not killing the son. But uh, God told Abraham, because you didn't hold back anything from me, I'm not gonna hold back anything from you. And so if, when we go to make these sacrifices, it takes a true uh, core level faith, you know, to say, God, man, I don't know if I trust you, but I'm trying really hard to have faith and believe you. Um, I think trust comes with earned ex with experiences. Trust is earned, you know. Um, so a lot of times faith can lead us to trust. Uh, in fact, that's, when it comes to the Lord, you know, um, that's the only way to, to lead to trust. Trust in the Lord is by faith, watching him carry you through things that you couldn't carry yourself through. But he did it at night instead of during the day. So God told Gideon, go, go take a bull that's seven years old. They were in oppression for seven years. So when God, because God would send them prophets, that's the way he always did with Israel, send prophets, man, you need, you need to repent, you need to stop doing all this crazy foolishness. If you don't, I'm gonna come in and wipe you out. You know, and of course they, you know, sometimes they would kill the prophets, you know, sometimes they would, they would jail them and shackle them, and most of the time they would just ignore them. And um, so when God released the Midianites to go in and ravage the land, his people, because God is, one thing we gotta understand about God, he's a holy God and he's a righteous God. And he cannot, he cannot handle uh, impure. Like he, it's just not any. Like, um, I guess my comparison, like I love my wife. Um, well, it's because I couldn't find anybody else to bury me, you know? <laughs> you know, it took a long time. You know, I think she still believes I'm rich. Uh, you know, that lie's still working. So just mom the word on that one. But I, it's not in me to love my wife halfway. It's just, it's just not, like I'm all in. If I start loving my wife halfway, we'll be divorced. It's just, that's just the way it is. I just, it's, it's all or nothing. Like, I, I'm just, it's just the way I'm built. Um, and so, uh, and I think that that's the way it is with the Lord. The Lord's all in on you. He gave his son, man. He's all in on your family. He's all in on those things that, that make you tick. And those things that, that uh, make you cringe, and those things that make you feel strong, and those things that make you feel love, God's, he's all in on you, man. He looks at you day and night. When you're going through those times and you don't feel him, he's there. He's all in on you. He gave the most precious thing he had. You know, uh, Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son, but God did. You know, that's pretty heavy, man. That's kind of like... Um, Jason doesn't have to sacrifice Judah, but I'm gonna go sacrifice Adeline. Well, I got news for you. If it took um, me sacrificing Adeline for y'all to get to heaven, uh, I got some bad news. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because as much as I just wanna walk into her half the time, you know what I'm saying? She's mine. I, I love the little fart. Can I say fart? I don't know if that works. <laughs> yeah, too late. We'll strike it from the record. So he did it, so, he, so Gideon's moving forward, he's doing things for God, he's doing what God called him to do, but he's still dealing with fear, he did it at night, right? So we're gonna scroll down to, uh, we're still in chapter six, we're gonna scroll down to verse 36. And he says, God will meet you where you're at, and he will encourage you. So Gideon said to God, you promised you would use me to save Israel. Please do something for me. I'll put a piece of wool on the threshing floor. Suppose dew is only on the wool tomorrow morning. And, uh, and suppose the ground all around it is dry. Then I will know that you have sent me to, uh, to save Israel. And I will know that your promise will come true. So he wanted the dew to be on the ground and the drag to be dry. Uh, dry. And then he, he asked for the opposite. I want the uh, drag to be, this rag, this uh, wool fleece to be soaking wet, but I don't want there to be any dew on the ground. So even after the Lord has done these things, Gideon's still asking, and he's still going to God. And that's, I think that's what's so important, man, as Christians, is we begin to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And we work through our own uh, doubts and our insecurities and our, our shortcomings. And it's keep going back to God, man. Don't stop. Even when I was backslid and, um, and was 
following my own, uh, the lust of my flesh and lust of my eyes and, and the pride of life. I didn't want to do it. I just was living by the flesh. I was controlled by the carnal desires of this world. And um, it was my own fault. It was my own choice. It wasn't a black and white. It was a slow fade. But I, I knew that, it, but I loved the Lord, you know. Um, I still prayed every day and uh, things like that. But I wasn't making those decisions, my actions. You know, we can all feel things, but when you, until you make the right decisions, you can feel all you want. It doesn't matter to anyone. You can, you can love your, your family members and, and your friends and all that, but until you show actions of love, what's it matter, you know? I mean, uh, you know, if, you don't, if we don't tell our children that we love them and we show them that we love them, the fact that we love them, what good is it? You know, it's, it's for nothing. That kid's going to show up feeling, grow up feeling unloved. And so you got to keep going back to the Lord, man, and bring him those things. And uh, don't be ashamed. God knows your thoughts. You know, any times the Lord has asked me to up my prayer time or um, cut out, uh, not even necessarily sin, man, hey, man, you need to turn that TV off at night, and you need to seek me for your family. and for You, you need to be ready. You just need to be ready, you know, especially as, as fathers, and, and, and I don't say it's in a, a male chauvinist way, because, you know, sometimes um, there isn't a, a godly man in a home, and sometimes the mom has got to be the spiritual head of that home, you know? It's just the truth. And, uh, and God bless them for it, and man, in a special, special grace and mercy be extended to those circumstances, because it's, it's rough. It's got to be rough. And, um, but I think, you know, as a parent, our, our three main priorities that I look at, anyways, is to uh, protect, provide, and prepare, you know, and, and that's it. So everything, decisions I make, they need to fall in line with that. Whether it be, hey man, how, how am I disciplining my child, or um, how am I nurturing my child, or wh whatever the case is. They, it's got to fall in line with that. So whenever I've got a question on, um, man, am I being, cause, you know, Mike Livingston ruled with a rod of iron. You know, this was his house. And I, I think, I'm pretty sure my butt's permanently swollen from all the spankings I got. You know, like, it's for real. Like, I got lit up. Like, look, he wasn't an abusive man. He wasn't a cruel man. He's still not. I love you, Pop. You ever see this? Uh, but, and very, very affectionate, very loving, very supporting, um, very encouraging. Um, he wrapped his arms around me and my brother every day of our life, every day, and told us he loved us, like, multiple times. Um, couldn't ask for better parents for either, you know, my dad and my mom. Uh, like, unreal. But at the same time, this is his house. He brought you in this world, and he'll take you out. So you know what? But that's how he dealt with us. Maybe, maybe I don't need to deal with Adeline like that. Maybe I do. But where does that lie at? So I always go back to that, uh, the three Ps, uh, protect, uh, provide, and, and prepare. And so uh, it's the same way with, with God, man. We're not sure. We, you go to God with those insecurities, and you go to God with those questions, and you go to God like, man, Lord, I know you called me to do this, but I do not want to do that. I like watching, especially now basketball's on, I like watching basketball every night till 11.30, and I'm doing like this, and I'm ducking off, you know? And, and I just tell them, I'm like, mm, you know, <laughs> how many times you, you, you've got those conversations, and you're like, hmm. I don't tell him no, because I'm not, I'm not, you know, trying not to be an idiot here, you know? I'm not going to try to tell God no. But um, deep down inside, I know, man, but I tell him that. I tell him that, hmm, because I don't want to ignore him, because I'm scared to ignore him. And then, but God will take that mm that I gave him, and he'll come back with something better. And he's like, here, this is why you need to do it. And he starts showing me things in my life, or he starts showing me things that um, if I don't pray, then I won't be ready for whatever happens. And, and to me, that's a, I mean, we have a responsibility, you know, as Christians. Uh, we have a responsibility as, as uh, family members, as coworkers. But, man, we have a responsibility to be ready in season and out. And it's just the truth. And, man, I raise both my hands and say that I haven't always, and a lot of times, been ready in season and out. So I'm not throwing any rocks up here. I don't have any stones in my pockets. But we have a responsibility to be ready in season and out. And, um, and I think that giving up those little things, um, it, it makes us ready. And God's not asking for a lot. He's not asking me to go um, you know, move on some mountaintop. Or he's not asking me to go kill them hundreds of thousands of Midianites, right? He's asking me to turn the basketball game off and spend some time with him, you know? <laughs> and I've got the gall to be like, hmm. I'm lucky he don't strike me right there. 
Don't hurt my recliner, Lord. I like my recliner. So Gideon puts the fleece out because he's still going to God with his fears. He's going to God with his inadequacies. Like I said, baby steps. Oh, so let me back up. So we back up to 32. I even had an arrow going back to it. So we back up to verse 32. So after Gideon tears down the altar of Baal, of course the people come out. Who did this? And uh, Gideon's like, oh, yeah, you know, I, I did it last night. You know, I was listening to God. You know, and they're like, that's it. String him up. And so Gideon's dad's like, hold on, hold on. let's let let's let Baal. If Baal's real God, we'll let Baal deal with this. So they gave Gideon a new name, and it was, it was Jerubbabel, which means uh, let Baal prove himself against this man. You know, so sometimes, man, when, when when we step out for the Lord, the enemy's going to attack. He is. Well, first thing he wants to do is distract you from ever stepping forward in the first place. And then when you do step forward, he wants to attack, and he wants to give you a new name. You know, he wants to, he wants to uh, intimidate you. He wants to show you all the weaknesses that you have in your flesh. He wants to uh, point out all the things that you've done wrong, all the things that you're not good at. And he wants to, he wants to get you looking at all of those things. That's what he did. They gave, so everybody started calling him Jerubbabel. You know, everywhere he went, Jerubbabel this, Jerubbabel that. And the enemy was just trying to distract Gideon. And uh, what we need to know, and Pastor said it earlier this morning, he says, man, we've got a name that's written in heaven. That's my name. I don't know what it is, but it's probably cool. You know, might be Daniel. Pretty cool name. So let's see. Okay, so that's, that was chapter 6. So I feel like chapter 6 dealt, because we were talking about chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 6 was, it was Gideon's part. You know, it was Gideon's part to, to stare that thing down, um, that fear, and to obey the voice of God. And just obey it and take those baby steps. And so it seems like right now we're, we're talking a lot about Gideon and, and working through his own fears and, and all these inner demons and all this kind of stuff. And sure, he did a lot of outward things. Um, but uh, in chapter 7, we're going we're gonna to talk about now that Gideon has done those things, what is God going to do? And how many times have, 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 have I know I've done it, and I don't, I don't have the, um, the backbone or I, I, to, to say, all right, God, what are you going to do? Like, who am I? You know, dude gave a son. Like, even if he never does anything else for us, we've got heaven, right? Um, but I've, I've gone to God and say, all right, God, what are you going to do? I can't fix this. And I don't say it in a, in a cocky way, but I say it in a way like um, that that trust has been earned, and I know he's going to do something. And... Even if he doesn't do something about the situation, he's going to do something He's going to change my mind, and he's going to put me somewhere else, whether it be mentally or emotionally or physically. He's going to take me out of the situation, put me in something else, or he's going to bring me through uh, this thing. Because how many know that God doesn't necessarily want to do a whole lot of things for us nearly as much as he wants to do through us? It's just true. He wants to, he wants to bring you through that, that situation because your family members are watching. Your, your neighbors are watching. Your coworkers, they're watching. And they don't want to see somebody that is being raised up as a sissy. Every time something gets hard, God just moves them to where they never, they don't, they don't have nothing inside of them. They're just a little kid, you know? They want to see somebody who's, now that's a man or now that's a woman. Man, now that's, a, that's a good husband, that's a good wife. Man, that family, dude, they're doing right by their children. That's what they want to see. They want to see that is this thing right here and what we give a few hours up on a Sunday morning, is it doing anything in their lives? Because if it's not and they can't see it, then what good is it for? You know, uh, it's just the truth. You know, if heaven's not real and, and hell's not real, then eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow you're dead. That type of situation. So uh, we're going to switch over to chapter 7. Flip my page here. So chapter 7, uh, Gideon rounds up the men of Israel, the little men from his tribe. They started out with 32,000 men up against, you know, hundreds of thousands of Midianites. So still severely outnumbered. And they all come together, and they're men of war. And, and, and those two were men that also had to deal with their fears and, and things like that that were probably threshing uh, wheat and wine presses, typical you know, things. Now, they didn't step forward and, um, and build an, uh, tear down Baal's altar and all those kind of things, but they stepped forward. So there's some level of commitment there to these men. Um, 
and it was 32,000 of them. And God says, man, that's, that's too many, you know. And Gideon, if I'm thinking that, God tells me, well, 32,000, 417 quadrillion. How is this too many? What's going on here? I'm no math, I'm, you know, I'm no for Albert Einstein here, but I'm, I think I'm missing something. And so God said, man, we got to get rid of them. So he tells me, he says, if anybody of you scared, go home. So 22,000 men left because they were scared. 22,000. So that's left with, uh, no, I'm sorry, 10,000 men left because they were scared. They started with 32, 22,000 men. Yeah, so now we've got 21,000. Hold on, my math is wrong. <laughs> Homeschool. Sorry, Pam. <laughs> started with 32,000. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, yeah, so 10,000 left. Okay, I got to read my notes right. I, wrote, I had to go upstairs last night because the kid wouldn't leave me alone. I was upstairs doing it in the craft room. Uh, so so, so 10,000 men left because they were scared. And then he says, all right, well, it's still too many. He said, tell them to go over there to this body of water and, and go get something to drink. And so uh, everybody went over there, got something to drink. And he said, the ones that, uh, that kneel down and lap up the water like a dog with their tongue, you know, from the water, um, send them home. The ones that kneel down and scoop it up with their mouth and bring the water to their mouth, keep them. So out of 22,000 men, 21,700 of them was sent home because they lapped the water like a dog. And I was kind of, in my mind, I always thought that that's because they weren't ready. You're supposed to go, be going to war and you've got your, your head down taking care of your own needs. Which look, it's a need. It's not necessarily a want, you're taking care of you're drinking water. If we don't drink water, we're going to die. But they weren't ready. There's a way about that we can go and we can live this life to where we don't embellish our every ounce of energy and time and money and um, efforts on our own needs. It's just the truth, man. It's a blessing to be a blessing. It, just, it is. If, you've got, if, you've, if you're going through something hard in your life, and uh, especially I want to say financially, man, go serve somebody. If you don't have no money, go give your time. It will liberate you. You'll go back home and you won't see those bills stacked up in the corner anymore. They'll still be there. You'll, you'll, they'll be in the back of your head because look, the bottom line's the bottom line. You know, we gotta keep the lights on, gotta keep the kids fed, whatever the case is. But it's not, it's not so overwhelmingly, because man, go serve. And it opens up and um, it puts things into perspective. And it allows you to take a step back from you trying to be God. And it's like, all right, God, you know, I've got a bottom line here. This is a need. What are you going to do about it? And then the Lord, you know, the Lord will tell you, hey, man, well, look, do this, that, and the other, or he'll just give you a peace. Because how many the Bible says that, uh, that God will give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. So a lot of times maybe we're not ready to hear an answer, you know. Sometimes, because um, what we really want in that answer is that we have a question. So when you, the time you have a question about something, there's an uh, unrest, an unsettlement inside of your heart, inside of your mind, whatever the case is. Um, and it could be just a simple well, um, you know, what's the capital of Idaho, you know, or just whatever, Boise, holla, homeschool, I think, maybe I was wrong, I'm very confident. <laughs> um, you're trying to get an answer, you're trying to justify that wrong, you're trying to make it right, you're trying to put that puzzle, make it, make it fix, and so sometimes we're not, we're not ready for that answer, and so God just gives us that peace, because that's what really what you're looking for in the first place. So he's got 300 men against hundreds of thousands. Now it's for the good part. So we're in chapter 7 and verse 8. What time is it? So Gideon sent those Israelites home, but he kept the 300 men, and they took over the supplies and the trumpets that the others had left. Let me stop before I move on. So he sent those men home because they weren't ready. God has sent me home a lot of times. He sent all of us home a lot of times. We weren't ready. Uh, because of X, Y, or Z, we just weren't ready. We showed up. We said we were ready. Um, but when it came down to it, when the rubber met the road, we weren't ready. That's okay. God has sent me home so many times. And, um, but every now and again, sometimes, ho hopefully, the more I do this thing, the, hopefully the better I'll get at it. I won't be sent home so many times, and I'll be ready to go be a part of God's victory. You know what I'm saying? I'll be ready to go home, and those things, those, all those, those uh, battles that were 
previously fought and, and the, uh, those victories that were won, to be able to follow this thing all the way through to the end, man, and see that big victory, you know, that one where, man, those loved ones are coming to Christ. Or, man, that, that, uh, my body's healed, you know. Uh, my financial situation has been, uh, I'm blessed now. I'm not cursed anymore. And you make it to the end, and you're like, man, now this is, this is what I was working for, you know. So if you get sent home, go home, lick your wounds, and start over again. It, if those guys get sent home, see if Gideon would have got sent home. He was ready. Man, go back to that, that first altar you built and start over. You're going to have the same grace and the same mercy. But, you know, a lot of times we keep, we keep people in our hearts. Um, we keep situations in our hearts. Um, we just live, we're just carnal beings, man. We just, we just are. We all got flesh. And we allow these things to just hinder us. And, we're, and you'll sit in the same spot, the same pew for 20, 30 years, and you don't ever grow in Christ. You should be some bountiful, beautiful tree, man, and people can come to you for counseling or wisdom or prayer, and you're just a beaming uh, beacon of God's awesomeness. Instead, you're just kind of older than what you were 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, <laughs> sitting in the same spot, you know. Same person, a little more wrinkles, uh, not too much more Jesus, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, I don't want to be that. That scares me. I think maybe Pastor said, maybe last week, week four, he says, I just don't want God to stop dealing with me and pursuing me and coming after me. Like, man, please don't leave me to my own devices. You know, it's just the truth, man. It's like, you know, we're evil, you know, and we're left to our own devices. We'll just sit there in a cesspool of nothingness and we'll be a drain and a cancer to our families and to our friends and to our churches as well. We'll get nitpicky. Well, I don't like the way he said that, or I don't like the way she ran this ministry, or I don't like the way this person does that. Meanwhile, we'll be sitting there on some pew. We ain't doing nothing, sitting on our hands. You know, you become that kind of Christian. Nobody wants those. Um, so get up and, and do what God's called you to do. Verse 8. Only the second time. We're almost done. So, okay, we'll start verse 9. So during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up, go down against the camp. I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, but what if you, are, if you are too afraid to attack, to attack? Then go down to the camp with your servant, Puro, or Furo. Uh, listen to what they say. What does it say? Listen to, what they, listen to what they are saying. After that, you will not be afraid to attack the camp. So Gideon and his servant, Puro, went down to the edge of the camp, and the Midianites had set up their camp in the valley so that the Amalekites and the other tribes from the east, there were so many of them that they looked like huge numbers of locusts, uh, like the grains of sands on the seashore, and their camels could not be counted. Yeah. So the Midianites had set up their camp. Yeah, well, I read that. So get it counted. Gideon arrived just as a man was telling his friend about a dream. I had a dream, he was saying. A round loaf of barley bread came rolling into the camp of Midian. It hit a tent with great force, and the tent turned over and fell down flat. Which, we, that's kind of a weird dream, right? What does that mean? I mean, we, we have, like, just weird dreams. I, mean, I was in Subway, and I was driving a new car, and I walked in, and Subway was upside down. You know, and I got uh, meatballs, and it kept falling off the Subways. You know, just, it's, it's a goofy, it's a goofy dream. But this dream wasn't so goofy because God gave it to him because it, it came with this crazy interpretation. And so God sends, uh, God sends uh, Gideon down because he says, well, if you're still afraid, it's okay. I'm going to give you another baby step. And uh, he sends that down with this, this uh, person named Fuhrer, the servant. And the name uh, Fuhrer means, let me make myself clear. Or let me explain to you. And that's what God, God was dealing with his fear, but you know why? Because Gideon kept coming to him. And he was obedient. He kept coming back. He was a glutton for punishment is what Gideon was. He's like, Lord, until this thing inside of me is burned out of my soul, I'm, I'm willing to die before I'm willing to be nothing. You know, like, like give me liberty or give me death type thing, you know. It was that fervent, passionate desire to be free, to not go back to that wine press, to be able to, to provide for his family, and to be able to live a life where people would come and destroy your crops and, and all the horrible things that came along with the Midianites. And so you got to give that to Gideon, man. Because people are like, well, man, this guy's, you know, he's not very faithful, you know. Uh, but it's like, well, look at what he was facing. And then he's not look at myself, man. <laughs> you know what? Maybe I haven't been so faithful, you know. Um, 
So he sends him down with his servant, let me make myself clear. Let me explain to you who I am and what I'm going to do for you. Because you've been obedient to all these things, you've, you've, you've tackled all these previous fears, it wasn't for nothing. How many know that when we serve God, it's not for nothing? There is a reward. There's a, that's the difference between Christianity and other religions. It's sacrifice, 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 sacrifice. And where's the reward? There is no reward. Seventy virgins in heaven, you know, supposedly, or, or whatever the case is, there's no reward. If you go look at a real Christian, they're going to be full of joy. They're going to be full of peace. You're going to want to hang around that person. You're going to want, want what that person has. And it's not, it's not money. It's not finances. It's not the big, fine homes. It's like, man, life, that guy's handled life differently. He's different on the inside. Nothing can take that man or that woman out. So when I'm going through problems, that's what I go through. Me and Carrie have gone through some marriage problems, believe it or not. You know? I don't know what her problem was, but she got it figured out, you know? <laughs> and uh, sorry, mother in law, you know? Mother in law knows. Uh, we went to Pastor Jim and Miss Julie, because, you know, they, they've been there. And uh, I see their marriage, and, and, and uh, I, I like it, you know? And maybe they can help me out. And so most of the time, which, or, well, we went one time, and Jim just, I sat down, and he just went ch -ch 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 -ch, all across my face. I was like, what about her? He was like, you shut up. We're talking about you. <laughs> it was good. It was really good. It wasn't, um, they told us what we needed to hear, and we needed to hear it. They didn't tell us all these other things. And they came in there with a message from God, whether they knew it or not. That's what we needed. And my marriage is, is, is better because of it, you know. And I'm super, super thankful for that. Um, I'm super thankful for the friendships that I've had in this church. You know, y'all have been so faithful. You know, y'all been here long, many of y'all longer than I have. And to watch y'all's faithful to me, it's just it's just overwhelming to see y'all here and involved and excited after decades, you know. I think I started here when I was, I've been going here about 25 years, I guess, give or take. And many of y'all, much longer than that. How long you been pastor in here? 30? Yeah. 35? 35 years. And they still have, they're new. There's a newness to them. God um, maybe doesn't reinvent them, for lack of a better term. He renews and restores and refreshes them. I've seen it. And I've seen it recently. I think I went over to the house maybe a year or two ago. And man, it, could just, it was all over me. And um, I just had to go see him. I said, go see my pastor. And uh, just to, I wanted to encourage him so much. Because I was so thankful to him. I mean, he's always Jim and Julie, you know? And, uh, and I love him. I love Jim and Julie. Pastor Jim and Pastor Julie. Um, but God was doing new things in their hearts, and I appreciated that. I appreciated the fact that they didn't get dull. And I appreciated the fact that they didn't just sit back and rely on their gifts and ease into retirement of the ministry. You know what I'm saying? I appreciated the fact that they were still pressing forward. And I just wanted them to, uh, to I wanted to encourage them. Hopefully that's what I did. Um, and just tell them that, man, that, that, that I noticed it and, and how much it meant to me. Of course, I mean, I started crying like a sissy, like I always do. And um, I was just so thankful for that, man. And that's a prize for, for somebody to be able to come up to you and say that. That matters. That comes from years of those, those baby Gideon steps. And, you know, one step forward, maybe two steps back, maybe not two steps back. I don't, you know, that teaches on. Um, but that's tangible. Somebody showing up at your house. It's not their house, you know what I'm saying? They've got their own. They're showing up at your house. And they're asking you for help. Uh, they're coming to thank you. Like, that matters. Um, because the effect that, 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 that they've had on all of our lives, um, like it matters. It's, it's tangible. Where was I at? The dream. Let's see. And they hit the tent with great force, and the tent turned over and fell down flat. And his friend replied, that can only be the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash. Gideon is from Israel, and God has handed the Midianites over to him. He has given him the whole camp. Gideon heard the man explain what, what the dream meant. Then Gideon bowed down and worshiped. He returned to the camp of Israel. He called up, get out. The Lord has handed the Midianites. 
over to you. And so I won't read it all because it's a lot, but so they, they had 300 men and they had these uh, bases and they lit torches and put them inside the bases. And so they each got strategic uh, groups, of, uh, three groups of 100, and they got strategically around the encampment of the Midianites. And then so Gideon says, look, man, don't make any noises. Don't show your torches and all this stuff. You just wait and follow my, follow my lead. So Gideon's 300 men, they, uh, they, they, they uh, took the torches out and they broke the, the, the pottery bases that these torches were in. They slammed them on the ground and said, for the sword of the Lord and Gideon, and they screamed it out. And then the other two groups of 100 that surrounded this camp uh, did the same thing. And so all of a sudden, they see 300 torches on the mountaintop surrounding them. And they hear this last, this super loud uh, crashing noises of this pottery. And then, you know how rumor mills are. That guy heard the dream. He was telling a buddy out. And then he went and told a buddy. So you got this rumor mill going around, which wasn't a rumor. It was God's vision, right, of Gideon's coming. And all of a sudden, they see all these, these lights lit up around them, and they said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So they got all confused, and they started killing one another. So Gideon fought him as one man. He did. He fought him as one man, hundreds of thousands of men, the least of the least of the least. Why? Because he took those baby steps, man, because he didn't stop pursuing God. He, he didn't stop saying, man, God, help me with my inadequacies. Help me with my flesh, man. Help me not be nothing. That's my biggest. I don't want to be nothing. I want my life to count. I just do. I want it to count for, I mean, for my family, for y'all. I want it to count for me. You know, God has placed things inside of me that um, they haven't been exposed yet. They haven't, they haven't, um, that fruit hasn't blossomed yet. It hasn't grown on my limbs yet. And some of it because it's the time and the season. Some of it's because of my own decision making. And I would probably say that's the majority of it. But I won't settle for nothing. Like, like I love my wife with my whole heart. Um, that's the way God loves, loves me, and I know that. There's nothing halfway. He gave it all. So it doesn't matter if, if, you've, if you've fallen over and over and over again, and if you've never gotten past the second baby step, you take that second baby step as hard as you can, like it's a giant leap. You, just, you lean into that thing with everything you got, and God's faithful if we're obedient. Amen? And so there was this gigantic victory. So you had... Uh, Gideon, the, the smallest tribe and, and the, the least member of his family. And so they see this big victory. And these many nights were running around, so they went down there, 300 men, and started chasing them, you know. And, and the Bible says that Gideon called to the surrounding tribes. He says, man, y'all want, want some of this? And they said, yes, yeah. so they teamed up with him. They're all following Gideon, somebody who, I mean, I don't know the time, a month before, six months before, a year before, whatever it was, was squirming on his belly like a worm in a wine press, trying so his, so his family could have one meal. That guy, a coward, the entire nation's coming behind him. And they even had some people from the mountains of Ephraim. They got, they got all mad at Gideon because Gideon didn't tell them. And they wanted to come down. They wanted to get some of the action. You know? it, was like a, it was a big deal. So, so Gideon says, all right, we're going to send messengers out throughout the mountains of Ephraim, and, and you're going to tell them. And they chased them all the way back, man, and they, and they destroyed them. And um, so that's a big victory, right? It's a pretty um, uh, amazing story. And 300 men against hundreds of thousands and, and something you would make a movie off of, right? All off of a coward making baby steps. If, a, if God can do that with a coward making baby steps, what can he do with you, you know? What can he do with us? Uh, it's a little small church, you know? I love this church. I love this church. I love the people in this church. Y'all have been so good. Uh, to me and my family. Um, and I, I, you know, I look at this church like my mother-in-law. I've never had one cross word with her, ever. It's all to her, you know, to, 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 uh, to her glory, you know. I'm sure I've given her a few reasons uh, <laughs> uh, to have cross word, but I've never had one cross word. I love my mother-in-law. She's been nothing good, her and Pop, Big H, been nothing but good to me, and good to my kid. Like, never. When I think about my mother-in-law, Miss Cindy, one word comes to mind. And it's just as simple as this, goodness. That's what I say. That's what every, and when, every time I see her, I think goodness. Like in the back of my head, you know. 
and or I see her on the phone. She or she'll FaceTime the baby, see what they're doing, if she didn't get to see her, you know, in a day or two or whatever. Um, it's just always made it warm with my heart. And that's the same way I feel about this church, you know. Man, this is God has planted this church, man, and we're here for a reason. And you know, we're we're not big, we're not uh, famous, and we're not uh, packed out to the gills. But you know what? We're a bunch of Gideons in here, man. We're all taking baby steps together. And um, I just want to encourage you this morning, man. Whatever you're dealing with, number one, go worship. You know, rip down that altar to Baal. Do the little things God's called you to do. And take those baby steps. You scared? You don't want to do it? Go tell God. That's one thing I've learned. Um, it's got me farther than probably anything, maybe other than hard-headedness, <laughs> you know, uh, is take that thing that you fear, that you don't like it, you don't like looking at, and you grab it by the collar and you pull it in. And you pull it in close, and you stare that thing in its eyes until it doesn't own you anymore, you know? You don't like the way your marriage is going, and, um, or you don't like the way your relationship is with your kids, or you don't like a situation at work, you don't like something on the inside of, of you that you keep falling into over and over again, you take that and you pull that thing in close, and you get to know to where you're not scared of it anymore. You know that's what the samurais used to do; they would envision their death over and over and over again, until they weren't scared of it anymore. That's part of what made them so deadly. They would go in there and just whoop tail. They weren't scared to die. They had families, so part of that when they pull it, they pull it in, or when they would when they would visualize their own death, they would think, okay, wife, young ones, or you know whatever else. People were uh, relying on them to eat and, and to live and all that stuff. So all that was factored in when they would visualize their death. They, but it, they made it ready. And so what we got to do is, man, those things that we don't like in ourselves, man, own them. But don't stop there because then you just be left. But what it does is it, it says, you know what, God? This thing's bigger than me, man. I thought I was, I thought I was something to be uh, contended with. And it says, God, I need you. Help me. And that's why you built, that's why, when you do that, you know what you just done? You built an altar. And then, take another baby steps, go build you another altar. And you set up altars, and then you'll look back along your life many years from now, and you'll see this line of altars that have been built. And you'll look back, and it, and, and it leads you to a place of trust. Because when you come up against your next, I don't know if God's going to bring me through this, you can look back and look at all those altars that you built with your memories and your obedience to God. He said, well, man, if he didn't bring me all this way to leave me here. Lord, what do I do? And you become a more effective Christian. You become more seasoned. You've just sharpened your blade. You've learned a new skill. And that's how you, at least, that's the only way I know how to do it. I'm not saying that I'm the best at doing it at, at all. But I want, I want my life to count. I, want your, I know y'all want your lives to count, you know? You want your kids' lives to count. And um, that's the only way I know how to do it. Amen? Yeah. But I'm done. I didn't mean to preach that long. Next time will be shorter. But I love y'all. Don't run away. Hey, I said don't run away. Oh. At least run it away. Hey, Amen. What can I say about Dan? <clears throat> Let me think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that he has, he's got the ability and the gift to read a story and bring it into reality, bring it into our lives. Amen? And that's what we need to do. We need to be able to read stories, especially in the Old Testament, and be able to apply them because the message is there. But I do have one thing. Hmm. I was looking at LSU. Yeah, I wore it on purpose. Yeah, I know you did. <laughs> and I was just sitting there thinking he wore LSU on his shirt. So I came up with three things that LSU stands for. And it doesn't stand for the Tigers either. LSU, you know, it's the Lord was sacrificed for us. All right? The Lord strengthens us. And then the last one is what I saw. The Lord shines through us. Amen. Amen. There you go. You thought it was the Tigers, huh? Yeah. And you thought you was going to bother me. Yeah, I did. Right? I did. That's why I did. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't want to say something because I don't want to be What shirt that, shall yeah. I wear to preach for Pastor Joe? Oh, yeah. This one. Amen. <laughs> no, I love him. Amen. Y'all tell him how well he's done. Amen. Father, we love you and thank you for this morning.
we just, <clears throat> amen, if we just ask your blessing upon his family, Lord, as he comes in and goes out, continue to use him and raise up the gift that's inside of him. In Jesus' name.